Declining water availability associated with climate change or aridification of the West is the most important driver of the current crisis in the Colorado River Basin. Brad Udall, an expert on aridification processes, explains by showing what's happened to water levels in Lake Powell and Mead. Less snow in the Rockies and other mountains combined with hot, drier soils in the watershed means that watersheds provide smaller flows into the tributaries which feed the Colorado River. Water availability in the system has fallen by more than a third from the amount allotted in the Colorado River Compact Agreement made 100 years ago. Because total water use has not declined commensurately, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, the system's two main reservoirs have been drawn down like savings accounts to historic lows. They are both under 30% of their capacity and approaching dead pool levels where hydropower generation will become impossible. Even releasing the water downstream might become infeasible without major infrastructure investments to move the water around the dams. The other important driver behind the crisis is the rising demand for water in the West. Historically, irrigated agriculture accounts for 70 to 80 percent of Colorado River water use. Most agricultural water use is for irrigating crops like grass, hay, and alfalfa that feed livestock in the region, elsewhere in the United States, and even as far away as Japan, China, and Saudi Arabia. In Utah, these forage crops account for about 80% of the crop revenues in farmland use. Major farming areas in Arizona and California also grow huge amounts of forage using their Colorado River allotments. Winter vegetables like salad greens are grown in Yuma, Arizona and in parts of the Imperial Valley of California, so forage crops are by no means the whole story. Water rights in the West are determined by first use, first right. So many farmers, like those in the Imperial Valley and Yuma, have superior legal rights to the water, rights that date back to the turn of the 20th century. And these rights are a big share of the Colorado River allotments. At the same time, reducing water use in agriculture will have to be part of any major effort to bring supply and demand for water into balance in the region, given the size of the gap. That will re probably require following some agricultural lands on a rotating basis. Urban and municipal water use accounts for most of the rest of the water demand along the Colorado River. 40 million customers in metropolitan areas all across the Southwest depend on the river for much of their water. And this number rose sharply over the past 25 years as population growth in the Southwestern United States took off. During the same period, municipal water conservation efforts have advanced. Surprisingly to many, Las Vegas has done the most to conserve water. There, and in many metropolitan areas, population grew substantially over the past 10 to 20 years, while total water use held steady, meaning that average consumer water use rates fell. Reducing outside water use for lawns, pools, and gardens has been one major means to conserve in urban areas. Xeriscaping is a modern approach using native plants in dry areas. Water recycling is another, a more large-scale investment that has been pursued in Denver, Phoenix, and Las Vegas. More water recycling efforts are coming online in places like Oceanside and San Diego, California. Meanwhile, in Utah, less progress has been made in advancing water conservation. Climatologists blaming unrelenting high temperatures and a record western drought made more severe by climate change being blamed for the lowest water level ever seen in Utah's Great Salt Lake. Since the 1980s, it's fallen by two-thirds, from 3,300 square miles to less than 1,000. And what's most amazing is that this crisis is happening in sight of one of the fastest growing urban areas in America, Utah's Wasatch Front. It's a metropolitan area with two and a half million people that's sandwiched between the Great Salt Lake and the Wasatch Mountain Range. As a result, major cuts in many urban and municipal areas may be hard to make. And as Cynthia Campbell explains, you cannot follow a subdivision. If IID or any of the large agricultural interests had to suddenly take large amounts of, of acreage out of cultivation, that does not compare. You can't fallow subdivisions. There are three more important pieces to the Colorado River situation beyond the supply-demand imbalance. First, Indian tribes across the Southwest are seeking to secure and expand their historic and potentially most senior claims to Colorado River waters. Their water rights, if expanded, could reshape water use and environmental outcomes, but this role is still emergent, not yet dominant, and is a subject of another video. Second, the Colorado River once nourished major wetlands. It actually ends now well before it even gets to Mexico, and the U.S. owes Mexico more water than is being delivered. 
Finally, many ecosystems along and near the Colorado River system are in duress. As water levels fall, water temperatures rise, soil replenishment and other local ecological processes suffer due to declining water flows and aridification of the West. This last point means that water rights for the environment are not accounted for by private and collective decisions about how to allocate the scarce water. They are not part of the beneficial use rules governing the river, and so they have to be brought into the discussion. And in 2022, we've reached a threshold much sooner than decision makers all along the river were prepared for. As Lake Mead, the nation's largest reservoir, is on track to soon hit its lowest level ever recorded. This part of the Colorado River system is a crucial water supply for Las Vegas, Phoenix, and Southern California. It makes the vast agricultural land of the desert southwest possible. The region is near a breaking point with respect to the viability of the system. As the Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Camille Toton said recently, You'll see a similar fact pattern in every major river basin. Hydrologic variability, hotter temperatures leading to earlier snowmelt, dry soils, all translating into earlier and low runoff. This is coupled, as the committee has mentioned, with the lowest reservoir records on record. There's so much to this that is unprecedented, and that is true. But unprecedented is now the reality and a normal in which reclamation must manage our systems. A warmer, drier west is what we are seeing today. While reclamation and its partners have been successful in conserving water in Lake Mead and Colorado River system reservoirs, more needs to be done as the system reaches critically low water levels. The system is at a tipping point. So here's what the Colorado River system actually looks like. It's divided into two basins, the upper basin and the lower basin. Most of the water flows from mountains in the upper basin in Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico into the system. There have been massive levels of federal investment and in infrastructure to create storage capacity throughout the upper and lower basins, with Lake Powell and Glen Canyon Dam on the one hand and Lake Mead Hoover Dam on the other, serving as the two crown jewels of the engineering and dam storage. Between these two dams, there are 55 million acre feet of storage roughly split evenly. The annual electricity generation capacity is about 4 billion kilowatt hours per year at Hoover Dam and 1.3 billion kilowatt hours at Glen Canyon Dam. Both right now are operating at about 60% capacity. Major U.S. government Colorado River projects date back to the turn of the 20th century. The efforts start with the Salt River Project in 1903, where a group of local farmers and ranchers put lands together to get the Roosevelt Dam built with the federal government. The Imperial Irrigation District formed around 1910 with similar goals to secure a steady, flood-resistant water system for the valley. These efforts resulted almost 20 years later in the federal government sponsoring construction of the All-American Canal that was built in conjunction with Hoover Dam. These projects kicked off a major era of reclamation investments all across the two basins that largely came to a close with the construction of the Glen Canyon Dam in 1968. The Colorado River system has been governed for at least the past 100 years by what is commonly called the law of the river. The 1922 Colorado River Compact allocated 15 million acre feet per year, evenly split between the upper and lower basins, each receiving 7.5 million acre feet. In 1944, the Mexican Water Treaty allotted to Mexico a guaranteed annual quantity of 1.5 million acre feet of water from the Colorado River. Together, these two allotments totaled 16.5 million acre feet. As a point of comparison, annual flows in the watershed over the past 20 years have been close to 12 to 13 million acre feet per year. The big gap between these two numbers, 16.5 and 12 to 13, is why experts often refer to the system as having a structural deficit, allotting more water than is available from the watersheds. Now, there have been many modifications in the rules since then, the details of which are covered in our Law of River video. But court rulings, local agreements, and legislation have shaped the priority of rights to water, distinct roles in managing the system, and so forth. And this process is often called the grand bargain within the law of the river. In the upper basin, actual water allocations are based on shares of the water that are available once they've met their commitments to supply a 7.5 million acre feet allotment to the lower basin. The lower basin has senior rights, and historically they have, not, they have used not only all of their 7.5 million acre feet, but often much more, upwards of 10 million acre feet. 
Since the 2000s, there have been several efforts made to confront declining water supplies along the Colorado River, and these efforts are also covered in more detail in another video. But in short, in 2007, interim guidelines were developed to help guide drought management choices with the intention to replace them in 2026 with new guidelines. Further drought contingency plans were pursued in 2019 with a major addition in 2021 that involved cutbacks and emergency measures. These efforts were all aimed at helping ease the supply-demand gap, especially at the two dams as their water levels were dropping precipitously. And they were also aimed at providing space to get to the 2026 guideline discussions. But here we are in the mid-June of 2022, and the seven states, the 30 tribes, and ostensibly the Mexican government have been instructed by the U.S. government to construct, by mid-August, a plan to cut 2 to 4 million acre-feet, or about 20 to 33 percent of current river use, starting in January of next year, 2023. In the grips of a prolonged and historic drought, tonight the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation announcing unprecedented water cuts to states along the Colorado River, the lifeblood of the American West. If they cannot come up with a common plan, then the Bureau of Reclamation will announce its own plan. Simply put, everyone is facing a full-blown system crisis at the same time as they're supposed to be initiating discussions on the 2026 guidelines for future river management. It seems likely that these two lines of discussion are inexorably tangled together now.